your main character in your book is named Trevor, who also happens to be Dominican as you are. Is this book a reflection of Ramon Almonte? Um, it's an exaggerated version of me, a couple of friends. There's other people in combined with that character. So there's, there's, um, there's a lot of me in there, obviously. And there's a little bit of other people as well involved with it. But with the, with the character, he goes through his trials and tribulation as as I did myself. So that that's an obvious one. But there's with if you look at the context, I, there the name of each chapter is not like accidental either. Would you like me to go into that now, or, or do you want to yeah, save that for a little later? Uh, one of the things I want to say is that. The storyline in your book, Scratching the Cosmic Conscious, which I, I encourage everyone to read it, to me raised many questions about a person's spiritual path. Can you embellish upon the importance of that for the listeners, the spiritual path? Well, when you strip away everything, let's take away your money, let's take away your house, let's even take away your physical body. What are you left with? You're left, you're left with a spirit, a consciousness. And that's who you really are. You're not a human person having, having a, a, a spiritual experience. You're a spiritual person, a, a spiritual being having a human experience. So scratching the cosmic conscience, the reason why I picked that is because we're barely starting to scratch this universal conscious, this cosmic conscious, this great beyond that we barely understand, that we've put so many labels on. And we are that. We're part of that. We are that. There is no separation in that. Just like there's no separation between Ramon Almonte and Steve Sidoni. But there's, there's that perspective of separation. You know, that's a good point because after reading your book, I came away with a deeper appreciation for life and the universe, knowing that we are all connected. Was that your intention in writing the book? You know, in the beginning... To be honest with you, I really didn't know where I was going. So writing the book was a journey for myself. And whenever I, you know, it took me six years. And whenever I didn't write, I felt like I was letting Trevor down. So as Trevor's character grew, I grew. And the book started defining itself. You know, things w would come to me. And I would get inspired from different things. And because of writing this book, actually pushed me right heavy into my own spiritual path. So at that time, I, you know, I was doing meditation, but I wasn't really doing research like I am now. I wasn't doing a radio show. I wasn't meeting all these other people that were really into this. So, you know, you would hear people here and there talk about all the different aspects of life, but... I wasn't really reading all these books that I'm reading now. I wasn't, you know, writing, taking notes down, and, and the best of all, the people that I'm meeting because of this book. So in writing the book, the book defined itself. Um, what does that mean exactly? I'm not really sure. I'm still figuring that one out. But the character Trevor, I think the character Trevor is a reflection of just a human species just as the the um, alien species that I call the arboreals are. Um, but they're where, what I would say, where we want to be at. So it's kind of like the, it's kind of like the preschooler looking at the high school student who's graduating into college and saying, oh, I'm going to be there one day. So when you have... Our, my main character meets these, these these alien species, and they're more advanced. And it's not that they're better, that they're gods. It's that they're just at a higher grade. So one day we will be there. So that's what I mean by the book was defining itself, because now Trevor has somebody to look up to. And this is, you know, the the most important thing that I want you to get from the book. If you don't get anything else and you think, you know, whatever you think about the book, the most important thing that I want you to get is that you don't need a master. You are your own master. You are your, your own sovereign being. 
and that's who you need to find. You don't need to go out and look and, you know, do all these things. You are your own guru. You are your own sifu, your master, your sensei. That's who you are. And so you are your student and master. I found your book, Scratching the Cosmic Conscious, fascinating. As I said, to me it was a cross between Avatar, The Matrix, and Reality 101 growing up in New York City. What I thought it was, <laughs> it was a, it's a, really a, a first-class adventure, and it's spiritually charged with sci-fi novel, and it has some roots. It's got some backbone. Even a Jules Verne a journey with a time machine, uh, sort of a twist to it. So I encourage everyone who are listening here to get this book, Scratching the Cosmic Conscious, because you will all thoroughly enjoy this book, as, as I have. Yeah, I am. Um... I really appreciate that. One of the writing things I, I would do is like, I would play either like some chakra music or some indigenous music or Navajo music, something to inspire me because what I what I kept repeating every time before I started writing was like, let me tap in, let me tap in. Because I didn't just want to write something to write, you know. It, if it inspires you, you know, if it inspires one person, and they make a difference in this world, then I made a difference in this world. And that's, and, and that's what matters. So to help inspire others and inspire myself, because, you know, the more I grow, the people around me grow. Well, i got to tell you, it inspired me tremendously. I have an interview to do probably Tuesday. It's taken me into a, a direction that I wanted to go in, but by reading your book... It allowed me to go more spiritually deeper into the solutions that I want to present as we go forward. A question for you, Ramon. Has living in Japan, in a different culture, helped you to better understand the shortcomings of our Western civilization? Yes. I no longer look at it that way. I look at it this way. I look at it as like it's helped me to understand the shortcomings of the human species. Not only, you know, because... The Japanese culture has its, definitely has its shortcomings, as so does, I think, all societies. There is this one side you have certain things from the Western cultures that's just terrible, and then on the other side, like, okay, so for example, in the United States, it's a pretty dangerous place, but not everywhere, but you can't just put your wallet down and expect no one to pick it up. Well, guess what? In Japan, I can put my wallet down and leave it on the train and forget about it and then come back a month later and someone had picked it up, gave it to the police, and the police have it there and all the money's in there. It's almost 90% sure that that that's going to happen. You know, unless a foreigner walks by it first, then you're in trouble. But (laughs) on the other side, then you have this apathy in Japan that is like, if you fall down, you better hope that someone helps you out because there's a good chance no one's going to help you out. They're just going to walk by because it's not my problem. I don't get involved. If I ignore it, it'll go away. So you have this these terrible things on both sides. So what living in Japan has helped me is like, okay, what's good for my society and what's good for this society? And let's combine that. You know, and and that's something that I started, as I was getting deeper into writing the book, I started putting in more and more solutions, and these things were coming to me, and it's like, you know, what what vision do I want to see into into our, our own future? How can we live? And just to give you a little background with the um, aliens, without giving it away, but they're a society that that's has combined the technology into the plants. So when you when you look at it, you know, I can have all these massive computers and all these things, and you won't even know. All you'll see is a forest, and it's just regular plants. And their transportation, everything is out of, you know, it's made out of plants. <clears throat> so it grows and dies. And I think that's the direction we should be going in. Yes. Ramon, without letting the cat out of the bag, so to speak, what would you say would be the moral of your story? Is there a lesson in the book, Scratching the Cosmic Conscious, for the reader to learn? Uh, yes, that you are your own master. 
you are your savior. You are who you're waiting for. Um, you are the change that you want to see as Mahatma Gandhi. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. That's who you are. Because Trevor, Trevor went from, from you know, there's, there's a part where he completely breaks down. And he he reaches to this other part, and that's, you know, and that's our goal. So what I want you to take away with this is that you are who you're waiting for. You know, waiting for these aliens to come down and save us or these, or, or you know, Jesus or Buddha, whoever you're into, you are that person. In your book here, yeah, when I was reading, there was... Your, one of your characters is named Felicia, who happened to be Trevor's girlfriend, who uh, I won't give this away, who Trevor was madly in love with. And uh, was this someone that you knew personally that you, uh, so why, why you use her in the book? Okay, so this is a funny story. So actually, this was, no one in my life died that way tragically, but sometimes you learn a hard lesson and in 2005 I had a girlfriend I was madly in love with and she always had her doubts about our relationship so when our relationship ended it was like she died so it was you know she pulled away from me so fast that it was like she she had died so for me personally, I went through a very, like, I shut down emotionally. Like, I became very cold. Yeah, your character, Felicia, put a, a very big uh, strain on uh, the character Trevor's psyche, where he had a hard time handling with, with the loss. And as I read that, I just thought it was important to ask you today what the correlation was between that character and if it was you know, came out of a, a personal situation. So I'm glad that you, you shared that with me because you explained it very, very emotionally. And I came away saddened by the loss reading the book. And I felt the closeness to the character based on what he was going through. Because if anyone's ever lost someone, I've lost my brother and other family members, it's, it's hard to put into words what that loss means to you, especially if you really love that person and you weren't ready for them to leave you or if they leave you in such a tra tragic type of a fashion. So I commend you for uh, your description of uh, Trevor's uh, pains that he was going through. You did a great job in explaining that in the book. Thank you. Um, you know, we've, we've all lost people. Um, you know, I've I've lost friends and family to, to some some tragic stuff, but you know, at the same time, is with Trevor, he he goes through it, and you know, not only that, it's that what you know what you must know is that you don't die, you know, you lose your your physical shell. It's like you know, the car is junked. Well, what you do with the junk car? You, you kind of throw it away, so you bury the body. But the, the soul, the spirit, the essence, that's not gone. You know, uh, science says that energy can't be destroyed or made. So wh what does that mean? I mean, the first time I heard that, that to me proved that, that there was life after death. 